Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you here on uh, Lilwat and Squamish territory, and a uh, real honor uh, for me to be here with my colleagues from across uh, Western Canada and the North. Uh, it was a, uh, a wonderful set of discussions at the conference. We had a very successful meeting and, uh, and very grateful for their time. Uh, my apologies to the media. We're starting a little earlier than uh, you may have expected. We were told we had to hit the Ontario uh, newscast deadline. Just kidding. <laughs> I, I grew up in Kitchener. I'm allowed to make, I'm allowed to make Toronto jokes. Uh, they, uh, they play particularly well in Western Canada. Um, we, had, uh, we had really productive uh, discussion on our shared priorities. Uh, we have uh, certainly big challenges in the West today. Uh, many of us have uh, grappled with very serious forest fires uh, this season. Uh, we have issues around finding uh, the people to fill the jobs that we have uh, to uh, drive our economies, our provincial economies, our territorial economies forward. Uh, we have challenges around the cost of living and affordability for the people that we serve. Um, but it's also a time of incredible opportunity for Western Canada. Uh, we see uh, the weight of population growth uh, shifting, uh, the weight of the country uh, to the West. Uh, we see that our provinces and territories offer uh, the energy and the solutions to many of the problems that the world's economy faces uh, and the security uh, to many countries that they're looking for around critical minerals and energy security, as well as uh, what our own country is looking for. Um, we had really important discussions about a number of topics of shared interest. In particular, uh, we discussed uh, strengthening our strategic infrastructure and trade corridors, finding ways to get our goods to market efficiently and effectively uh, to grow our provinces and territories' economies, but also uh, our national economy, to collaborate on climate action and adaptation, uh, including uh, addressing issues of energy security both domestically and internationally related to everything from electricity uh, to energy project pro products like LNG. Uh, we talked about how provinces and territories are key partners in the immigration system, how dependent we are on uh, working together with the federal government around immigration to address issues of labor shortage, uh, certainly, and also to ensure that uh, people who arrive newly to our provinces and territories receive the support that they need. Uh, we talked about our uh, labor market and the need to remove barriers to ensure uh, labor mobility, uh, but also to meet the needs that we have in our different uh, provincial economies. Uh, the premiers from the north uh, talked about uh, the critical importance of Arctic sovereignty uh, and preserving Canada's Arctic sovereignty. And, uh, and it was uh, that a uh, priority on, on that agenda item was supported by all premiers as we recognize uh, the importance of a free uh, north and uh, sovereign north uh, that is a critical part of Canada and uh, is of interest internationally right now, especially uh, following recent events. Uh, finally, uh, we discussed crime and uh, the bail reform bill uh, that uh, was uh, not passed uh, at the federal level uh, and our shared urging to the federal government to prioritize the passage of that bill and our shared deep disappointment that that bill was not passed in the recent parliamentary session. Uh, the uh, last few years taught us uh, through the pandemic, certainly, uh, that we can solve big problems if we work together. And uh, while we're not uh, going to agree on everything, we are uh, uh, politicians, first of all, and, uh, and, uh, and we sometimes have, uh, have challenges finding points of agreement. Uh, but, uh, but actually, uh, during our meetings, uh, I think, uh, the focus, because uh, we're focused on Canadians, because we're focused on our communities and who we represent, uh, we found very broad areas of agreement, shared priority, and how we can work together to not just improve our own homes, uh, but to uh, really help build uh, the Canada that we're all so proud of, um, we're all uh, 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 so proud to be a part of, and, uh, and that Western Canada, we believe, uh, will provide such prosperity to uh, going into the future. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, open it up for questions from the media. Um, all Premiers uh, are prepared to answer questions, and I'll pass it over to our MC. Thank you very much. A reminder to media on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. We will begin with media here in the room. Our first question comes from Richard Zussman, Global News. 
Uh, Premier Eby, you speak about growing pressure on Western Canada uh, due to the population shifting west. Is there a call from the Premiers here to change the way that projects are funded from Ottawa to better compensate for that population growth or growing pressure to this part of the country? Um, well, I'd, uh, I'd certainly invite uh, another Premier to weigh in uh, as well. Uh, but my feeling was um, from our conversations today that we see huge opportunity in the uh, growing numbers of people that are choosing to live in particular in Western Canada in the north. Uh, but we also uh, see challenges that come with that if that's not done in a thoughtful way. Uh, that the need for the federal government to work with us to ensure that uh, we're targeting immigration that helps address uh, pressures that we see in our labour markets. Uh, so in British Columbia, certainly uh, around construction, around childcare, uh, skilled trades, uh, we all discussed uh, the need for healthcare workers, um, making sure that we're, uh, we're uh, leveraging uh, uh, immigration and uh, in partnership with the federal government to make sure that we're uh, growing our populations but also growing our economies. Uh, and uh, the only way we can do that is to do it in a coordinated, coordinated way. The second piece um, uh, that stood out for me from the conversation was how critical it is that the supports are in place for new arrivals. We talked in particular about uh, new arrivals from Ukraine uh, and uh, making sure that they have the support that they need uh, when they're arriving uh, in provinces under that special federal government program uh, that uh, is going to be renewed in mid-July. Uh, and treats that particular population differently than other refugees uh, coming to Canada. And so uh, making sure that there are supports there, not just for uh, Ukrainian refugees, but for uh, new arrivals generally, including international students, temporary foreign workers, uh, and others under federal programs, including uh, uh, people immigrating through regular pathways, uh, is uh, critically important for all of us. I wonder if there's another Premier that uh, is interested in uh, sharing a perspective on the immigration issue. Uh, the only other thing I would might add is the importance of having per capita funding with no strings attached so that each jurisdiction has the ability to identify the projects that are, that are important to them so that they can continue to grow with their needs. Uh, acknowledging that small jurisdictions uh, like the territories need a special arrangement so that they can ensure that they've got the, the funding support. We're also interested in equivalency and fairness. I think that uh, if the federal government wants to help support those projects, they need to be mindful of providing some kind of equivalency in each jurisdiction. Those are some of the other issues that were raised. And to the, the point of equivalency, and it, this may be for Premier Smith, I'd also like to hear from Premier Eby on this as well, is this more money to Western Canada and less to Ontario and Quebec, or is this more money for all provinces uh, from the federal government? So how would that sort of breakdown work, considering the pressures we're feeling here in the West that may be different than what they're seeing in Ontario and Quebec? Um, Thanks. I won't uh, speak for the whole table, but certainly uh, from British Columbia's perspective, one of the messages that we continually send to the federal government is whether it's uh, housing money, uh, whether it's money for uh, uh, economic development related to climate, uh, and ensuring that we're competitive in the global transition that's happening, uh, uh, whether it's uh, funding for Indigenous housing, whether it's funding for infrastructure, uh, that British Columbia needs to see at least our fair share on a per capita basis uh, with other provinces. And again, uh, we recognize uh, the unique needs of places like uh, uh, the territories, like the North, uh, to have special arrangements. Um, but I have been concerned, and I've shared that concern federally, that BC has not seen our fair share of uh, this type of funding. And uh, you'll see in the communique uh, the emphasis from all provinces that that needs to be a key consideration of the federal government uh, for funding programs. It doesn't mean that other provinces need to be funded less. It means that the funding that's available from the federal government needs to be distributed fairly. Yeah, I, I would agree uh, with Premier Eby on, on, on all of that. And, um, you know, our, our, our natural resource-based economies, uh, innovation-based economies in the, in the western half of our nation are, are, are growing. Uh, you know, for example, in Saskatchewan, we're growing at a, our fastest rate from a population perspective 
um, that, that we have in 108 years, over a century uh, we, since we've uh, grown at the rate uh, that we are. And I think that's true in, in many of the uh, the Western provinces. And and so there is uh, concerns, I, I think, uh, at least from Saskatchewan's perspective and, and likely others around fair and equitable treatment, investing in uh, in uh, in in the, the the settlement services, for example, of, uh, of of new immigrants, including Ukrainian immigrants that are coming uh, to our to our communities, there's uh, concerns around uh, the investments that are being made in that you know that very economy. And as we are you know finding our way to not only producing products, uh, energy products, for example, that have been used in the past or being used today, uh, but as we prepare to uh, produce those uh, those products that are are going to be in demand tomorrow, the rare earth elements, the lithium, those those. Uh, those types of, of products. And so I think uh, we would share in some of the fair and equitable balance uh, of investment, uh, not only in the advancement of um, and preservation of the jobs in, in the in the strong economies uh, that we have in our respective uh, provinces and territories, but also in, you know, supporting those that are coming to uh, participate uh, in that economy as we, uh, you know, as we grow our, our province's population and we grow our, our community's population and those services are are necessary and need to be provided. And so we, we, we discussed uh, that, um, you know, that fair and, and equitable investment by, by other levels in, of government, namely uh, the federal level of government. We, I think, look forward to uh, continuing that discussion uh, right through to the Council of Federation table. So I'd like to add on from the North. From the, north uh, the other ones can join if they want. Um, the North is different. Um, when you talk about equity, equitable services, then then you need to think of the North. And I think that all the premiers at, the, at this conference have agreed, and that's why they identified that the North is, is different. We are at the forefront of climate change. We're at the forefront of Arctic security and, and safety, which people are now paying attention to. We have infrastructure gaps that are huge that people don't realize. We have no road systems to many of our communities, some of us to any of our communities. The, energy sources are not there. We're reliant on diesel. We don't have the telecommunications that people take for granted here. So when we talk about equity, we need to make sure that the people in the Northwest or the North period have the same level of services that people in the South take for granted. So yeah, I do think that there needs to be a redistribution of the wealth. And I do think that uh, the federal government needs to not only uh, give large funding to the eastern provinces. I think they need to take care of the west and the north. We are all Canadians and we all deserve to prosper. Thank you. Our next question from the room comes from Benoit Ferradini, CBC Radio Canada. Uh, hello, uh, my question is about climate action. Can you detail what you request from the federal and also uh, are there different views depending on where climate change had the most impact provinces or territories? Uh, thanks. Uh, there was uh, a broad interest uh, across the table um, from all premiers and certainly from all Canadians about uh, reducing uh, carbon pollution and addressing climate change. Uh, I would say uh, that there was certainly some anxiety around the table from premiers um, from some jurisdictions, particularly around timelines related to decarbonizing the electrical uh, generation systems in their provinces. Um, British Columbia is fortunately in a position of having a lot of hydroelectricity uh, and the ability to support jurisdictions other than ours. So um, uh, certainly part of the conversation was how do we support each other uh, in uh, sharing uh, our strengths and uh, one of those uh, that British Columbia was able to put on the table is if we can find ways to intertie with, for example, with the Yukon uh, to uh, support them in their efforts uh, to access uh, more electricity to grow their economy and decarbonize their electrical uh, grid, um, then, uh, then that's very good news for everybody. And so uh, that was what uh, my takeaway was from the discussion, was uh, that we need to look to each other's strengths uh, to support each other in the work that we need to do. Uh, and that the federal government in their programs uh, needs to look at each province in terms of our strengths and, uh, and also uh, where we're going to need additional support and consideration for the unique uh, positioning of our provinces. Um, I wonder if there's another Premier that uh, is interested in... 
Sure. I mean, I can I can weigh in as well. I mean, obviously, it won't surprise you that uh, the $13 billion investment in Ontario's battery factory and the Atlantic Loop and the significant investment came up. And we've got equivalent investments that need to be made in Western Canada. We've got carbon capture utilization and storage in Alberta. We've got hydrogen. We've got uh, various jurisdictions exploring small modular nuclear. We've got the strategic infrastructure that needs to be built in the northern communities with ports, as well as rail access so that we can get critical minerals to market. And so seeing that the federal government's prepared to make those kinds of investments in Eastern Canada is fantastic. And we support that, those kind of investments. That's what I'm talking about with equivalency is that there has to be a recognition that if we're going to address these issues, we have to address them in different ways in each jurisdiction. And there has to be a similar amount of, of interest and investment from the federal government. Uh, yeah, I just I really appreciated the the conversation about collaboration today, and uh, speaking with Premier Eby and 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 focusing on uh, for us in the Yukon the the potential of a grid connection. It's 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 foundational to our ability to reduce our emissions and to meet our uh, climate change goals. Uh, we're having a we're having a season this year where um, we're lucky we can deploy resources to our neighbors that are dealing with um, with fires, and um, our flooding season has been uh, minimal this year. But I, I mean, the collaboration is going to be key. I think, uh, as Premier B said, there's there's strengths that uh, we all can lean on. Uh, for us, uh, a great connection to British Columbia, the early stage conversation, that opportunity not only will drive a northwestern uh, Canadian economy when it comes to critical minerals um, and do it uh, in the cleanest way possible, but it is also going to help us meet our uh, our overall goal. So I think um, the support from the premiers, especially from the provinces, and as Premier uh, Cochrane touched on. Um, understanding the uniqueness of the North and having the uh, provincial leaders from Western Canada stand by us and understand and support us uh, is, is so important coming to these meetings. And I just really appreciate that over the last uh, two days. To add a bit as well, I think the, the most impacted region uh, by climate change is right in the North. Uh, we see it daily as people who rely so heavily in terms of the, the, the ice uh, and really the discussions that we've had were really powerful in terms of uh, our ability to see nation building projects such as the Kivad del Hydro and Fiberlink uh, that really would allow us to be able to, to get away from diesel. Uh, but right now there's no outside solutions that allow us to be able to get out of uh, diesel uh, as we move forward. Uh, but we do have the solutions as David mentioned in terms of uh, solutions that really allow us to see nation uh, investments uh, really in the north, in western uh, Nunavut in particular, I look at the Grace Bay uh, Road and Port as a project where really there's uh, 22 of the 31 critical minerals that we could provide not only to Canadians but to the world uh, that really would unlock these incredible uh, resources uh, and that would really create in incredible jobs uh, that tie obviously to the climate change that we see uh, so the discussions that we've seen and have had here has been uh, really fruitful from the lens that uh, there's a, such an infrastructure uh, deficit in the north that it's important to recognize that uh, gap and for us to, to really play a leading role in terms of providing those solutions as we move forward as well in, in light of climate change. If I can just add on one thing to that as well. Um, as stated, the north feels climate change four times as the south. Um, and I appreciate uh, uh, Premier from Nunavut actually speaking and saying we don't have a choice. Many of it, most of our communities, all of our communities, except for a couple, all of Nunavuts, are reliant on diesel. We don't have an option to get off at this point. So my point is that you can't make one policy to fit all of Canada. It doesn't work. The carbon tax is a huge example of that. It's an incentive so that people will get off and use renewable energy great incentive, except when you don't have any alternative, what it became is a punishment to people in the north. We're experiencing climate change, our, our, our animals are migrating that we don't know, our, the, our elders don't, aren't able to read the land anymore, our fires are, we're, we're experiencing fires in the south, we've got flooding in the north, we've got snow in, in communities, as this is all in the last week. And uh, so one policy throughout Canada will not work. It's important that the federal government work with all jurisdictions to identify what we know, 
We live there, so we need to have a say on what policies will be implemented for us. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chuck Chang, Canadian Press. Chuck, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is directed towards Premier Smith. Um, the federal government uh, announced this morning that speaking of both infrastructure and climate change, uh, the federal government mentioned that they are tying uh, future uh, infrastructure transfers to uh, whether or not a project is resilient to climate change. I was hoping to get your reaction to this uh, about uh, this type of whether, whether this impacts your view in terms of how to approach future infrastructure transfers or projects or working with the federal government on that front? Well, I'll have to see what they mean by that. I mean, part of what we just went through in historic fire season and part of the thing that we need to concentrate on is how do we build fire guards for community and be pro proactive for that. We also know that with flooding, there's infrastructure we need to build to make communities more resilient against flooding. Those are the two biggest risks that we face in, in our province. Some of those require um, just major infrastructure investments. So I'd, I'd be curious to, to see what what uh, what they would have in mind. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm prepared to work with the federal government on things that make sense for Alberta. What makes sense for Alberta, since we are a natural gas basin and we are a hydrocarbon fueled economy, is working on carbon capture utilization and storage, working on hydrogen, working uh, with our partners in British Columbia in particular on exporting LNG so that we can reduce emissions around the world. And uh, the and those are the kind of investments that that I'm hoping to be able to partner with them on. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, and Premier, one one quick follow up uh, from our Edmonton bureau. Uh, uh, we were wondering if you have any reaction to the doctors in Alberta calling for a possible ethics investigation into Dr. Henshaw's dismissal. Thank you. Um, no, I I have a a person I've hired at the head of Alberta Health Services, Dr. John Cowell, to make. Uh, personnel decisions. He makes personnel decisions. It's up to, uh, it's up to him to answer those questions. Okay, we have a last question in the room before we go to the phones. We'll hear from Mira Bain, CBC. Sure, and this question is for Premier Eby. This is about interprovincial trade barriers. What solutions were discussed around that that the federal government can help with? Thanks for the question, Mira. Uh, the uh, key discussion. Uh, around the table in terms of barriers to trade uh, really focused on the uh, transportation and logistics uh, issues of getting goods to market uh, and making sure that there's access uh, to international markets for products from provinces. Uh, the uh, discussion was very constructive. Uh, we're going to continue to work together to identify ways that we can ensure that there are strong trade corridors uh, to make sure that uh, for everything from tele telecommunications to energy products to uh, transporting goods, uh, that we're able to, to work together in an integrated and strategic way to be able to uh, deliver these goods and so that we don't face uh, barriers like traffic bottlenecks, that we don't face barriers like incredibly lengthy, by which I mean uh, decade-long approvals, processes, uh, and uh, that we're able to deploy and respond quickly to what the needs are in the market and to take advantage of what we all agree is a remarkable time of opportunity for Western Canada to respond to the world's uh, interests in our products. Uh, we don't want to miss this window. And so working on removing those barriers was the, the key focus of our discussion. Okay. Yeah, um, so this question is for uh, Premier Smith. Uh, today, Federal uh, Environment Minister um, said that Canada isn't ready for the impact of climate change, that it has a lot of work to do. Why does your government continue to stall the transition to more sustainable sources of energy? We don't stall anything. We just don't accept that oil and natural gas should be phased out. And by the nature of your question, I'm assuming that's what you think needs to happen. I totally disagree. We are going to reduce emissions and we're going to reduce emissions by carbon capture utilization and storage, by um, uh, transitioning to hydrogen and by working with our partners to export LNG. We're going to have continued use of hydrocarbon fuels for petrochemicals. Dow Chemical is, has a, a zero emissions petrochemical plant that they're uh, close to making a final investment decision on. Air Products has a, is, near to a, is making a net zero hydrogen investment. Our oil sands are making a net zero investment by 2050. We're increasingly seeing bitumen beyond combustion for the use of bitumen for asphalt, which is a construction material. And so that's the, that's the framework we need to get into. 
is that we are not transitioning away from hydrocarbons. We are not transitioning away from oil and natural gas. We're transitioning away from emissions. And we have, have embraced the 2050 target. Going to the phones now, a reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You'll be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question from the phones comes from Jonathan Bradley, Western Standard. Hello, Premier EB. Um, you mentioned when you were speaking that you guys had taken steps, you guys were speaking about steps to address labor shortages. What steps uh, do you intend on taking? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Great question. So uh, we shared uh, uh, around the table uh, steps that we're taking within our own provinces to address uh, everything from healthcare worker shortages to skilled trade work shortages. For example, in uh, BC, we have the Future Ready Skills Program. Uh, we also talked about uh, the fact that the uh, federal government programs that support the skills training that we do in our provinces uh, is uh, in BC. Um, is coming to an end as a result of a, a court decision about official languages and that we're entering into renegotiations, but that generally the federal government has indicated that they're uh, wanting to renegotiate uh, those agreements as well. Uh, and the need for flexibility for provinces to be able to determine uh, training needs and deliver uh, training programs in our provinces. We talked about how, as a good partner with the federal government on immigration, that uh, we can tailor uh, our provincial nominee programs to address critical labor shortages in our markets uh, in a way that the federal government simply can't do, and, uh, and the need for the federal government to lean on us more, to, to, uh, to see us as a true partner in immigration, to be able to, uh, to ensure uh, that their initiatives around welcoming new arrivals to Canada is as successful as possible. I wonder if, uh, uh, Premier Stephenson, if you have any Sure. Yeah. Just to add to that, we also discussed um, labor shortages within healthcare. So health human resources is a very significant issue um, right across the country, including in, in Western Canada. And so we had a very good discussion about how we can share practices and how we can learn from each other and what is working in various jurisdictions. Uh, I know in Manitoba, we, I talked about our, our um, health human resource action plan. Uh, which is about recruiting, retaining, and training uh, more healthcare professionals, uh, really aligning what is needed with post-secondary institutions, uh, as well on the training side, uh, looking at uh, immigration as a tool there. Uh, recently, we just uh, um, we, we signed on with the Philippines. Uh, we signed um, more than 300 healthcare professionals to come to the province of Manitoba. These are some of the things that we're looking at doing and breaking down the barriers uh, for those that are trained elsewhere and looking at recognizing their credentials as well. And so these are some of the issues that uh, that we talked about specific to healthcare. And uh, I believe um, uh, Premier Evie touched on, on other labor market uh, challenges as well, but certainly it's really that alignment between post-secondary um, as well as what is needed uh, in our uh, business community as well. Follow up, Jonathan. So my follow-up question is, you mentioned during the your opening marks, Premier EB, that public safety and crime was an issue that you spoke about at length. What do you want to see done to solve crime and public safety issues? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, Premier shared uh, uh, feedback uh, around the table in terms of what we're doing in our provinces to address uh, the issues of, uh, of violent crime in community uh, and issues of mental health and addiction that often uh, impact people's feelings of safety and as well compromise the safety of those who are living outside or struggling with addiction in our streets. Uh, and there are a number of really important initiatives uh, taking place across Western Canada to address these issues. And it's really helpful for us to get together and share uh, what we're doing and to learn from each other. Uh, there was lots of, oh, can I visit this uh, initiative that you're doing? Can I talk to your staff member that's leading that work? Uh, that information sharing is critically important and, and welcome for me and I, I think for all of us uh, throughout the discussion. Uh, but uh, specifically, um, we all struggled to understand uh, the uh, decision that was made in the federal parliament not to call the bail reform bill. Uh, this is something that was a focus at uh, the Council of Federation. All of the premiers across Canada uh, agreed that this was a priority 
Uh, the uh, police have called on the federal government to make this change. And uh, the bill was drafted, uh, went through first reading, and then wasn't called for second reading. It didn't make it uh, past first reading and, uh, and is now uh, deferred until at least the fall. So we made a point in our communique of underlining our deep disappointment that that was the case, that the bill didn't get called and passed. We understand it has the support of all the parties in the provincial or in the federal parliament. And, uh, and a calling on the federal government to get this bill passed at the first opportunity uh, in the fall session uh, because of the urgency of the matter. Uh, I wonder if there's another premier that wants to speak on the issue of public safety. Sure, I can just touch on it briefly. I think you covered uh, most of the areas, but I think it's very important to just emphasize the fact that we are all uh, united across the country as, as premiers and ministers of justice and public safety on calling on the federal government for bail reform. Um, we were happy when they listened to us and brought forward a bill, but of course they have not uh, followed through on that. And of course, if that is if that um, if those changes are not made uh, for bail reform, obviously it, it has a significant impact in our communities, and we're seeing that right across the country. But I think what's also important is that the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police we met with them. Uh, as a Council of Federation, and we heard loud and clear from them that they needed our support as well when it comes to bail reform. And uh, so we were united on this front, and, and I think I would just reiterate the importance of this. Um, we, we need to make sure that those violent offenders do not continue to get out on bail. Uh, we need to make sure that this reform takes place as quickly as possible. And I might just add that the the companion to the discussion is the issue of how we um, address mental health and addiction and all of the premiers have a, a number of programs in place to address uh, mental health and addiction treatment and uh, taking a recovery approach in Alberta of course we've got a recovery oriented system of care that forms the basis for how we address mental health and addiction issues and we've got um, 11 recovery communities that we're building but to each of the each of the premiers know that there's sort of two sides to this there's the those of who are the victims of the, this disease and the victim of those who are, who are peddling these uh, these poisonous opio opioids, and then there are those who are on the crime side that we've we've got to make sure that we're addressing that that side of it too. Our next question comes from George Antunes, Nunatsiak News. George, please go ahead. Hello there. Um, this question is for. Um, Thank you, first of all, everyone. But uh, this question is for Premier P.G. Uh, Kiyoko. Um, sorry. Uh, regarding the... Sorry. The Premier's... Um, hold on one second. Sorry. Uh, the Senate National Security Committee is going to release its report on Arctic security. Uh, a year ago, you and the Territorial Group Premiers demanded and got a meeting with the PM on Arctic security. So obviously, this is an important issue to you. Uh, have you been briefed on what recommendations the Senate will make in its report and what would be helpful for for the Senate to recommend? Uh, yeah, thank you, George, for that question. Uh, first, I just want to thank uh, my colleagues here uh, from the North in particular uh, with what we saw uh, w w with Ukraine, uh, the single uh, shift in terms of the attention of the North really came in terms of the vulnerabilities we have in terms of the Arctic security and sovereignty. And I can't thank my, my friends around the room here in terms of the support we've received uh, in terms of really putting uh, the, the, the attention to, to the issues that we see here. Uh, and I, I really feel it's important to, to again signal the in infrastructure deficit we see in the North uh, has really made Canada vulnerable in terms of where we stand uh, globally uh, as, as a country. Uh, we're aware and we are looking at the recommendations that have gone through uh, th in terms of uh, the, the House of Commons as well as in terms of the Senate as well, uh, in terms of key infrastructure areas we'd like to see uh, move forward. So I'm sure uh, the Chair, Caroline, uh, would like to add as well uh, in terms of this very important topic. Thanks, uh, PJ. I think the again the the point that I'd like to make is is again one policy doesn't fit all, and um, the North is unique. It's it's got some real great strengths there, and it's got some real challenges there. So it's inappropriate for any government, the federal government, to make the assumption that they know what what's necessary in the North, and they will take care of our safety. Uh, 
I've seen too many people come from the south and come up to the north and think they know what's what they're getting into and come out with frostbite, vehicles sunk in the ice, being lost, having to get rescued. So I think the big thing is, is that if we are talking about Arctic safety and Arctic sovereignty, it's important that Canada talk with us, that they actually um, consult with us, not just uh, listen, but actually hear us. Because there are a lot of things that we know that are different from the South, and I'd hate to see Canada make the mistake and think that they know best when it comes to taking care of the safety of Canadians. They have an obligation to work with us. We have an obligation to make sure that all Canadians are safe. And the North is vulnerable. The sea is opening up. So work with us. We're, we want to make sure that all Canadians are safe. But Canada cannot do it alone. I think what I um, really appreciated today uh, was the support again from premiers uh, across um, Western Canada. Uh, the work that uh, Carolyn and PJ have been uh, focused on has been going on for years when it comes to this conversation. Uh, what we need Canadians to understand is that investment into the North uh, is, it's, it's almost a, a triple threat in the opportunities. One, it is, it's securing uh, the, the sovereignty of the North. It, to it's, it's opening up economic opportunities. We know that critical minerals are gonna be key towards our uh, future transition and uh, the North has lots and it's gonna be infrastructure investment, whether it's telecommunications, uh, electrical grids, uh, new roadways, uh, all of those things, uh, port development are all key. And third, it's really about Arctic security. Uh, most news outlets will know uh, we were in the Yukon on the front line uh, of an object being shot down. We learned a lot in, in uh, early February from that experience. Uh, we think uh, there needs to be uh, more active conversation with the federal government. Uh, Premier Cochrane's done a great job uh, chairing the Northern Premier's table, and uh, but but I think all three premiers, we would all say we we feel there has to be more of an active dialogue, and so we're looking towards the findings. Uh, but I think what I, I again really appreciated was there was a sense of the meetings I, I believe today where we were all looking at nation building opportunities. Uh, there was a, um, uh, a push towards being able to look at big projects, how they're important to Canada, uh, and the aspirations of Western Canada. And those, that's the, the energy that we need when we think about the North, that things are possible, but they're big ideas, but they have to be put in place if we're going to compete with the other circumpolar um, nations. George, do you have a follow-up? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Our next question comes from the phones, and we will go to Mike Ruddick of CBC Whitehorse. Hello. Um, I guess my question is uh, is for uh, Premier Ranch Pillai. Um, just wanted to know how much money would you like to see the Yukon get in federal funding to boost infrastructure because of the effects of climate change? I might. I, I believe it's a case by case basis. I you know we're there's so many different areas um, that we have to look at. Whether it's uh, climate change adaptation mitigation, uh, we we've, we've watched and looked at best practices from uh, British Columbia and Alberta after significant events. Uh, whether that's uh, you know large fire breaks, that type of work. So I I, I think it would be um, I can't put a dollar figure on it uh, at this point. I think what we do want to see is we want to see a federal government that understands. There is a uniqueness to the north. Uh, when you look at the tenders that we have going out from a, you know, our capital budget is, um, it's really strained because of the extra costs that we're seeing across the country. And uh, so I, I believe we want to make sure that the federal government understands the unique circumstances. I really appreciate coming out of these meetings with the support of um, the Western uh, premiers, which means a lot uh, going to the table. And that's something that both Carolyn and PJ have always been able to uh, to pull together. So it'll be, um, what is the next type of infrastructure program Canada has? What does it look like? How is it going to roll out? And will it be flexible and understand the uniqueness of um, each jurisdiction? That's what's on my mind. Mike, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes. Um, again, uh, this is for Premier uh, Pillai. Um, just uh, maybe if you you know, it's been a year uh, since the last uh, Western Conference meetings, and I'm just wondering, um, have you seen an improvement in 
the federal government what they're doing to help with uh, to strengthen Arctic, Arctic sovereignty here in the north. I think the conversation's changed. Uh, in January, uh, the focus became all of a sudden this this uh, very significant uh, situation that occurred, and you know we were um, collectively we were all in Ottawa uh, uh, working on the Canadian healthcare transfer. Uh, there was conversations we uh, Yukon delegation had with the Department of Defense. We identified the fact that we thought there was a potential threat. Um, that happened on Thursday. Uh, there, there were smiles, I think, from the folks that we met with that we were, uh, maybe uh, our imagination was getting the best of us. And then on Saturday, we were seeing uh, deployment of Canadian military into the north. So the conversations changed a lot. People are very focused on it. Um, our neighbours uh, and our allies that are part of NATO in the circumpolar uh, north know it's important. And, you know, I, I would just say that uh, the provinces have been uh, incredible in supporting the territories. And we just want to make sure that we're collectively at the table um, with the federal government making decisions. Um, I'll, I'll touch on one piece. The, if when you take into consideration how long it takes in our country to build uh, a very substantial project like a port in Nunavut or a port in Northwest Territories or the Yukon, and you think about all the steps it has to take, uh, and the time, uh, we're behind already. So we need to invest now and we need to be able to look uh, into the next 10 and 20 years as shipping routes open up. Those are the things that we talked about and the table was very supportive in those conversations. If I can add on to that as well, um, I think that the federal government is starting to, uh, to pay attention a little bit more to the north. Of course they have to because of what's going on. Um, I do believe that at the beginning, the federal government thought that they know what is best. Uh, they talked about military, they talked about warships and things that, that yeah, in the Northwest Territories, we don't uh, pay attention to those things. We don't uh, have those. But what they fail to realize, and I think they're coming to the realization, realization now, is that, like I said, um, what, what they, people take for granted in the South is, is a luxury in the North. Um, I don't think they realize that uh, they need dual purpose infrastructure such as hospitals, telecommunications, airports, road systems. And I think that uh, at the beginning they thought they were fine, they had all the answers and I think now that they're starting to realize that maybe they don't have all the answers and so if they want to address Arctic safety then they need to address Arctic sovereignty at the same time and that means dual infrastructure is uh, should be something that they're paying attention to. Yeah, just if, if I could as well, I think the conversation has shifted, but we haven't yet seen any investment of that to the magnitude that we need to see from the lens of uh, nation building uh, in terms of Arctic security and sovereignty. Uh, so we, we come to the table, I think, with strong solutions, uh, whether it's uh, corridors that we've talked about here in the Western Conference, uh, but also really energy security that we've talked about, whether it's the like Kibad uh, Hydro link, uh, whether it's the Iqaluit Hydro that's been discussed, uh, really that provides that dual purpose, but it's, we have yet seen any major investment uh, that comes to address uh, the issue that uh, came here. So I just wanted to add that as well. To add one other piece on, on how this conversation has changed, and we discussed uh, this as well, and, and, uh, and I think many uh, provincial premiers um, would, would would agree with with the respect with respect to um, um, we need a, an all of Canada approach uh, to um, to to our sovereignty in 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 the north. It, it, this is part of our country, and most certainly uh, we need to uh, have a, an all of Canada approach. All of Canada supporting our, not only our Arctic sovereignty, the security of our north, um, and we can do that through a number of different ways. Uh, through advancing some of the, as you say, the circumpolar relationships that we have with other countries, including uh, the United States with Alaska uh, in that region. Our Prime Minister was in the Nordic uh, countries here uh, just this this past week, um, but. Also through uh, um, activity, 
uh, in the north. Activity through, uh, we talked about connectivity, whether it be roads, whether it be communications, uh, whatever that might be, improving the connectivity to our to our northern communities. And ultimately, um, you know, some of the result of that is, uh, is, is uh, you know, advancing our, our economic interests for the folks that live in the north and for our, and, and what's good for uh, the, our northern territories, most certainly, uh, is good for our nation. And I, I think, uh, you know, part of the, the conversation that is always, is, all, is also changing is the priority on Arctic sovereignty, Arctic security that uh, we're seeing from uh, maybe the 10 southern provinces. We have time for a final question. It goes to Saif Kaiser, Global Edmonton. Saif, please go ahead. Thanks so much. Good afternoon uh, for Danielle Smith, Madam Premier, in these conversations with your counterparts across other provinces. It seems uh, infrastructure was a key issue. So when it comes to pipelines, the energy sector specifically, what sort of conversations have you had with other premiers regarding building or coordinating any future energy product uh, projects, rather? And how do you balance those with a potential environmental impact? I think what uh, we, you'll find the, the premiers share a common cause in is building out strategic in, infrastructure and economic corridors. And it, and it looks different depending on, on which direction we're going. That I, I think what you'll, you'll find is if we can, if we can identify the, the zones that will make the most sense from an economic development point of view for each region, then we can work backwards and figure out how we build the infrastructure. And it could be roads, it could be rail, it could be transmission infrastructure, it could be pipelines, it could be um, uh, internet access, broadband, uh, fiber. So th I, I think that that's where we need to get to is a, in a conversation is how can we in the West work together with our, our strategic partners to build out that infrastructure so that we can get all of the products that we need to market. It, it, it certainly isn't just a single issue around oil pipelines or natural gas pipelines or hydrogen pipelines. It, it also includes a, a discussion about how we get critical minerals to market. I would just add to that as well. We had a, a great discussion and even went beyond uh, the, the national transportation um, infrastructure that we have, but really starting at, at the market. And, and, you know, what we do across much of this great nation is we, we export products to, uh, to other areas of the world. And we export some of the most sustainable products um, available in the world. And we most certainly should recognize that. And so you, you look at, you really, what, what um, and, and Premier Smith had brought this forward and we had a good discussion around, you know, look at the market where these products are actually arriving, these, these sustainable products uh, back to the port. And, you know, what can we do to work collaboratively on ensuring that our ports have the capacity, not only for today, but for the products of tomorrow, then our in nation transportation systems, whatever that might be, whether it be rail, whether it be pipe, whether it be highway, whether it be air, um, um, or, or roads, uh, for that matter, and, and how uh, we are prepared with our in-nation transportation uh, infrastructure to get uh, those products, uh, to continue to get those products to their uh, to that port and ultimately to that market, and then right back to the production site and realizing that, uh, you know, many of the products that we are producing here in this nation are some of the most sustainable products that you can find on, on Earth. And, um, you know, we had a discussion about, uh, you know, our nation, and there's an article out a couple of days ago with respect to some of the divisions that that we're seeing across uh, this nation and we most certainly i think have a role to play uh, in that as subnational leaders in 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 bringing this nation back together and ensuring that we are are being proud of not only what we're producing uh, in canada from coast to coast to coast but how we are producing those products and and so we had a good discussion about you know for for instance i can speak to saskatchewan but each premier can speak to the product products that uh, that you know they're producing we we produce some of the uh, the lowest carbon agri-food products that you can find on earth and we're now exporting some of the innovation in that industry that's helping other areas of the world, the US, Australia, Ukraine, India, um, produce uh, similar uh, um, or more sustainable uh, goods. The same with the energy products coming out of, the oil products coming out of Saskatchewan, 25% lower uh, carbon emissions per barrel of oil than, than their global, global counterparts, net zero oil company operating uh, in our province, potash, half the emissions of their competitors around the world. We need to be equally proud of products that are produced as, as people in Saskatchewan in other areas of Canada and really get back uh, to supporting one another because what's good in Ontario for Ontario communities is good for Canada and that's good for Saskatchewan. What's good for British Columbia communities is good for not only the, the economy and the families that are residing in British Columbia, but it's good for all of us as, uh, as Canadians. And, and it's, uh, it's high time and I think each of us have a role in, in bringing our nation back together and being proud of one another from coast to coast to coast.
coast on not only what we produce, how we produce it, and what we what opportunities uh, we each have in our respective regions as we look five and ten years down the road. If I could just jump in there too as well, um, and I, I think you you you've uh, touched on it. But I think what we really, this was like a start of a discussion today that is really exciting, I think, for our country, not just for Western Canada, but for our country. And I think, you know, from this and as, as chair of our Council of Federation, um, this is something today that from a high level we want to take uh, nationally uh, and, and have that discussion about a national uh, transportation and trade uh, strategy and infrastructure strategy across the country. And so we touched on that today. We started to get into all the exciting things within each of our, our territories and our provinces. There's a lot of exciting things happening out there. But I think we want to take this as well and have that discussion at the uh, the Council of Federation as well. So lots of more exciting things. And, and uh, as um, Scott uh, said, you know, bringing our country together in a very positive way, I think, is uh, what, what will come out of it. Saif, do you have a follow up? Uh, yes, I do. Again, for uh, for Premier Smith, I want to follow up on a question you were asked probably like a dozen ago now. You know, you say you put John Campbell in place to field questions like why Dr. Dean Anshaw was given a job, accepted the job, and then unhired the following uh, day or the following day after it became public. But Cavill's not commenting. Alberta Health Services isn't commenting. Uh, I, I know you won't comment on that personnel change, so I won't ask you to. Instead, I'll say that over 100 doctors signed a letter alleging political interference and they want an investigation. So yes or no, was there any political interference? And how do you ensure, Albertans, that there wasn't any? As you've made it clear numerous times before you were elected that you're not a fan of Dina Henshaw. Look, we, we have a lot of change that we need to make in Alberta Health Services is the reason why I dismissed the board and put in an official administrator is so that we could accelerate many of the, the decisions that need to be made. And there's going to be a lot more decisions that have to come. Um, and there's going to be a lot of personnel changes that have to come. And that's why I've delegated that to Dr. John Cowell to make those personnel changes. And we are going to make sure that we've got a system that focuses on the front line and focuses on having the right people in the right position doing the right thing. Our mental health and addiction strategy is led by mental health and addiction, Dan Williams, and I would encourage you to, to talk to him about what the strategy is going to be there. But um, I think people should expect that there's going to be a lot of change in, in our health system over the coming weeks and months as we make sure that we address the issues that have been chronic problems for literally decades. And that's what we're going to be focused on. And Dr. Cha Dr. John Cowles had his, ex his contract extended six months, and he's going to be leading that effort and making those personnel decisions. So those are the kind of questions you'd have to put to him. Thank you very much, everybody. That concludes today's conference.